What a distinct honor it is for me to be here in this amazing tropical paradise to speak to you in this devotional address and to be able to perform for you this Thursday evening with five of my wonderful prodigies whom I hope are excited to be here as well. Thank you, President Cowie, for your personal invitation those many months ago to bring us here for this thrilling opportunity. To start, I want you all to know that as I considered the topic for today, I was deeply impressed by the Spirit with one particular topic of the many that I was considering. The value of the soul. I want each of you to know that our Heavenly Father and His magnificent Son, Jesus Christ, knows you and me personally by name. They love us unconditionally and they care about each one of us and that we succeed in this mortal life. Because we are God's children, His royal offspring, the value of our souls is enormous. You'll remember that in his early ministry, the Savior taught, unless we become as little children, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, what does that mean? So let's think for a moment about the characteristics of children. Children, as you know, at least most of them, are loving, kind, they're giving, trusting. From their innocence and their joyful excitement for life, their amusing antics, they often make us smile and laugh. A little wonder why our Savior adored children so much. Here are interesting instances of little ones that I thought you might enjoy. And these are true instances. Children were lined up at the cafeteria of a Catholic school for lunch. At the head of the table was a large pile of apples. A nun had written a note, take only one, God is watching. Moving through the line to the end of the table was a large pile of chocolate chip cookies. A boy wrote a note, take all you want, God's watching the apples. <laughs> During the bishop's talk one sacrament meeting, there was a loud whistle from the back pew. Gary's mother was horrified, and she pinched him into silence. And after the meeting, she asked, Gary, whatever made you do such a thing? Gary answered soberly. Well, Mom, I asked Heavenly Father to teach me to whistle, and he just then did. <laughs> and this little four-year-old girl prayed, and forgive us our trash baskets as we forgive those who put trash in our baskets. <laughs> Adorable. <laughs> a small boy was overheard praying, Lord, if you can't make me be a better boy, don't worry about it. I'm having a great time as I am. And one morning, a mother decided to make pancakes for her two young sons, Tyler, age seven, and Johnny, age four. But to her surprise, the boys began to argue over who was to receive the first pancake. Well, seeing this as the perfect opportunity to teach her young sons a gospel lesson, she said, now boys, if Jesus were here, he would say, let my brother have the first pancake. To which Tyler quickly replied to his younger brother, Johnny, you be Jesus. <laughs> and finally, a woman invited some friends over for dinner. At the table, she turned to her little six-year-old daughter. She said, 
Would you like to say the blessing on the food, sweetie? I wouldn't know what to say, the little girl replied. Well, just say what you heard mommy say, the mother said. So the little girl bowed her head and said, Dear Heavenly Father, why on earth did I invite all these people to dinner? <laughs> yes, children are precious. In so many ways, they teach us how to love life and to keep hope and excitement alive. Nice piano. <laughs> I usually don't get nice pianos in situations like this. In contemplating the value of the soul, I'd like you to ask yourselves this question. Who are you? 
You might answer with your name, but that's just what people call you. And you might start telling others that you're kind, you're funny, you're generous. But those are only characteristics of your personality, not really who you are. So, who are you really? Do you know? We're talking about identity. We must understand, brothers and sisters, that our own self-worth needs to be understood before we will be able to see the great worth in others. Our mate, our children, our family members, friends and associates. As an example, for those of us who are married, how do we value our spouse? Adam and Eve must have had an ideal marriage, don't you think? He didn't have to hear about all the men she could have married. And she didn't have to hear about how his mother cooked. And then there was the time a senior citizen's cell phone rang while he was driving down the freeway, answering. He heard this, his wife's voice urgently warning him, Herman! I heard on the news that there's a car going the wrong way on I-40. Please be careful. And Herman said, it's not just one car, it's hundreds of them. <laughs> From what or where does our true identity come? Unfortunately, many people feel that their true value comes from popularity, exceptional athletic ability, superior musical or artistic gifts, awards and the praise of men, oh, and acquiring large sums of money, keen intelligence, physical appearance. Now, there's nothing wrong with bodybuilding excelling in sports, achieving awards, and mastering musical instruments, amassing large sums of money, or receiving accolades from colleagues. But we must not allow our identities to be founded on these hollow, superficial things, which can actually create within us false security. Let me introduce you to my youngest prodigy here today, Parley Brooker, not only a talented athlete, football, skiing, and golf, to name a few sports he loves, Parley is already an accomplished pianist at age 12. I'd like to now invite him to perform for you Rachmaninoff's Pali Chanel.
Thank you, Parley. For a moment, let's contemplate the following statement about false security, profoundly expressed by our late apostle, Elder Neil A. Maxwell. He was one of my favorites because he always said everything so well. Quote, think for a moment how different it would be if people took on that physical appearance which would reflect distinctly how well they were doing spiritually. How would some of today's beautiful people really look? A highly publicized movie star, beautiful though she might be physically, if her life were fully represented in her appearance, might be ugly, perhaps with a hunched back, a pruned face, or a withered arm. How ironic it is to be jealous of someone who has a pretty figure or a handsome face, but who is a spiritual cripple. Close quote. Magnificent apostle. I'm quite certain that God doesn't care about achieving vast honors of men or whether or not we're unattractive. He's not interested in medals, trophies, nose jobs, and tummy tucks. <laughs> He's not interested in those. But he does care that we understand the incredible value of the soul that comes from true identity from our understanding that we are children of God. Now, once during a teaching moment, a bishop held up a $100 bill and asked the gospel doctrine class who would like to have it. He said, now, I will give this to one of you, but first let me do something. He then crumpled the bill up in his hand till it disappeared in his fist. Okay, he said. Now who still wants it? <laughs> well, everybody was chuckling. The class members looked at each other like, really? Okay, all right, but let me do something else to it. He threw the bill on the floor, and he started to stomp on it, and he ground it into the ground with his feet and his heel of the shoe. Now, who would want this $100 bill, he said and everybody's hand still shot up. Amazing, don't you think? But what he said next really made that class think. Brothers and sisters, he said, why is it that no matter what happened to this $100 bill, whatever it had gone through, wherever it had been, you still would take it? Well, it's because you still recognized its value. Nothing it had been through could change its value one bit. Wow. In like manner, the master placed great value on people during his lifetime. Regardless of where a person had been in life, Regardless of that person's sins, weaknesses, or strengths of any individual, Christ understood the value of the soul, and he ministered daily. In modern revelation, the Savior said, quote, Remember the worth of souls is great in the sight of God. Doctrine and Covenants, section 18, verse 10. And then the magnificent Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 4 and 7, we read, Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. What an incredible example and explanation of our value. Brothers and sisters, we are royalty joint heirs with Christ. Many years ago, my self-worth was challenged, to say the least, 
during my participation in an international piano competition. Let me just briefly share with you what happened. There were 168 international preliminary contestants from all over the world that supplied the preliminary tape. And from that, 32 quarter finalists were accepted to actually come to the, um, the place and the venue uh, and country. And we all played our quarterfinal round. And then we had 16 of those advance to the semifinals. And I happened to be fortunate to be one of them. And just as I was about to go on stage for my semifinal round of competition, I felt this tapping on the back of my back. I was kind of behind the curtain still. And I turned around and it was the Russian competitor who also made it into the semifinals. And he said in his broken English, David, I heard you're playing in the quarterfinal round yesterday. And you played like a pig. <laughs> And they announce my name and I walk on stage. <laughs> well, problem is he doesn't, he didn't know me very well. That only makes me want to do better. I'm kind of competitive that way. So I, I just want to conclude this story with, and, and please know that I'm extremely humble and I'm not being egoistic. Positive self-worth with faith in Christ develops confidence. I advanced to the finals. I think I'm supposed to not say the next. <laughs> he did not. <laughs> Sorry, I just ruined your mic. That's a true story. <laughs> Let me share with you one of those pieces that propelled me into the competition finals. I should probably say that it's an etude by a Russian composer, Alexander Skryabin.
excuse me, the Russians get excited. <laughs> My young brothers and sisters, we've just got to stop allowing other people to tell us whether we're good enough, attractive enough, rich enough, famous enough, desirable enough. Stop it. Just stop it. We should only care about what Heavenly Father says about us, that we are of immense worth. In so doing, however, we must be aware of the great destroyer who is working daily to destroy your self-concept. You know, the great destroyer is the great deceiver, the ultimate lying liar who will stop at nothing to separate us from God. His tactics really haven't evolved much since the garden, but he's certainly adept at staying ahead of the curve. The great deceiver's specialty is his keen interest in your feelings and opinions and personal preferences. He's quite progressive that way and wants to hear all about it. Your concerns are his concerns, and he knows exactly which rendition of Jesus is pertinent to your cause. Lately, it is likely to be a socially relevant liberal Jesus who somehow cares more about your truth than the truth he came to personify, proclaim, and die for. The deceiver dishes out a new gospel. And I, I hate this, just so you know. I don't like that word hate, but this one thing I do hate, the gospel of your own truth. You ever heard it, brothers and sisters? Oh, my truth is... And then he whispers to all of us, ah, that's much better. To be clear, he won't tell you to give up your faith in Jesus, but that obviously some of his outdated theology needs revamping because it no longer works today. A good chunk of it is offensive enough to be considered a hate crime, especially that bit about marriage and sexuality, I mean, Jesus told his followers to love one another, not judge one another, right? So who are you to judge how others love? That's just how stealthily and insidiously the father of lies leads members of this church astray. He distorts God's word and presents new, different gospel to each generation and he knows how to place deceit in our hearts. He's well acquainted with our carnal desire to rule and worship ourselves. And he's happy to show us how. Simply put, Satan wants to destroy people. He wants to thwart God's kingdom and purposes and plans. He wants to hurt the people God creates and loves. He wants to wreak havoc on those who are chosen by discouraging, disarming, and derailing us. He wants to confuse people and lead them away from the truth of who God is. He wants to kill and destroy the soul of every man, woman, and child. But guess what? We don't have to be duped. Jesus told his disciples, you remember Matthew 24? Take heed that no man deceive you. And I might want to add, he's not even a man. This warning is applicable to every biblical topic and all aspects of our daily Christian walk. There's only one way to prevent the great deceiver from having great influence in our lives. We must focus on Jesus the Christ. His truth, his words, and the gospel he came to proclaim and die for so that you and I would never again be separated from God. Yeah, 
as you all know, life can be extremely challenging. In fact, it's just plain hard. And I hate to tell you, young people, it only gets worse the older you get. But our Heavenly Father knows of our enormous potential and divine worth. He knows we can be victorious in the cause of truth and righteousness. So I just want you all to think and to remember that when the gray clouds of life appear, always remember that the master understands, for he has already experienced these things. He. is the perfect example for us to follow and will always be here for us if we but allow him to be the great dominating force in our lives. No, he's not going to barge into our lives, but he does stand at the door and knocks. You and I must let him in. One of my very favorite scriptures for many, many years in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 5, and I want you all to remember this, remember this daily, because I've learned this principle through my life, and it's so completely true. In John, chapter 15, 5, the Savior said, I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. May we all recognize the value of the soul, that every soul is of divine worth in the sight of God. And let us never forget that the eternal value of our souls is the very reason he gave his life for us, the very reason that we are saved by his grace. I so testify in the name of him whose church this really is even the Master, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen.